Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israel preparing for potential retaliation from Iran after the deadly strike in Syria that took out generals in Iran's military. And Iran hinting it might go after the U.S. as well. A top Israeli political leader calling for new elections. We're going to hear the response from the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. White evangelical voters have turned out for former President Donald Trump in the last two elections. We're going to take a look at how this coalition came about and the key issues in this year's race for the White House. And signs of the end times we're going to hear from the co-authors of a new book, Revelation 911, about modern day events at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and even UFOs and how they tie into biblical prophecy. All those stories and more coming up next right here on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. I want to begin this half hour in Israel, which is preparing for possible retaliation from Iran after a reported Israeli strike in Damascus, Syria, that killed two Iranian generals and other members of its military. Now both the Israeli Defense Forces and the Home Front Command are preparing for war. CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini vowed Israel would pay for the attack against its operatives. They will be slapped for that, of course. Day by day, the regime will become weaker, and God willing, it will get closer to demise and destruction. Iran's President Raisi and Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah hinted the U.S. also might be targeted. America is undoubtedly an inevitable partner in the crimes of the Zionist entity in Gaza. The enemy will be defeated as well as all who stand behind this enemy. Iran may view the upcoming Al-Quds Day as a time to retaliate. On the last Friday of Ramadan, Iranians chant death to Israel and demand the end of the so-called Israeli occupation of Palestine. Anticipating the threat, the IDF is increasing its air defenses and canceling vacations for all military pilots and calling up air defense troops for duty. As the country raises its defenses, it's also preparing to go on offense. Israeli media is reporting the IDF will launch a media campaign to prepare the civilian population for an escalation in the north. With the country on heightened alert, Benny Gantz is calling on his rival, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to agree to new elections in September, two years ahead of schedule. I believe that uh, the Israeli society needs to renew its contract with its leadership. Netanyahu's Likud party says an election would freeze Israel in its tracks as it wages war in Gaza and prepares to step up the fight against Hezbollah. You still have soldiers fighting inside Gaza with Hamas, and you also have a, a much larger war potentially looming with Hezbollah in the north. Uh, and if you go to an election right now, that could really paralyze uh, the ability of the politicians, including the prime minister, who would then be a, a caretaker prime minister with limited authority, uh, to be able to conduct the war the way it is truly necessary. As the Israeli government deals with the fallout after the accidental killing of seven international aid workers in Gaza, Netanyahu and President Biden are scheduled to speak by phone today. While Biden has expressed outrage over the deaths and opposes Israel's goals to invade Rafah and wipe out Hamas's last military battalions in Gaza, the White House insists it still backs Israel in its war against Hamas. And Chris Mitchell continues our coverage now from Jerusalem. So, Chris, we'll talk about the possibility of elections in a moment. But first, what are you hearing about the preparations in northern Israel for a greater <coughs> war with Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran? Well, Ephraim, we've been hearing of a major escalation for months with people up there in the Galilee and further beyond and right near the border. Uh, we know people are buying generators uh, with the anticipation that there might be major uh, electrical outrage, outages. Uh, so that's why it's a big thing that our people are, are doing about. There's also the talk of, you know, getting more cash in case ATMs are, are unavailable. Uh, they do this all because Hezbollah has a much bigger arsenal than Hamas ever did. It has precision guided missiles so they may be able to hit strategic targets uh, as well as power plants and idea bases. Uh, right now we have 80,000 Israelis that are away for their homes on the northern border and some are saying the war with Hezbollah is inev inevitable. And by the way, if you travel to the northern border, Ephraim, your GPS gets scrambled and if you're in Google Maps or Waze, 
Uh, sometimes it just has a, a weird, weird uh, locations. And right now it's not only on the northern border, but also in the center of the country. The goal behind that is to interfere with any, any logistics, uh, navigation of UAVs, missiles, and even cruise missiles. Chris, how much of an escalation was the strike in Damascus, which killed two Iranian generals? Well, it was a, it was a major uh, step in the in the war between uh, uh, Israel and Iran. Some people say it took it out of being a shadow war between now a direct war uh, between these two powers. It wasn't a, an attack on one of Iran's proxies, you know, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, or the Houthis, and probably the biggest strike. Uh, against the Iran leadership since General Soleimani, uh, you know, about two years ago, uh, actually about 2020. Uh, so it raises the stakes in the region, and uh, certainly that's why there are reports right now in Israel of canceled vacations for IDF pilots and this uh, increased escalation of, of preparing people for perhaps a major escalation and war on the northern border. Let's switch now to the domestic scene there in Israel and Benny Gantz calling for a new election. Is that something the Israeli people want? Well, I would say most Israelis don't want that, certainly not in the middle of a war. Uh, you know, many people may not like Netanyahu, may not agree uh, with him politically in many areas, but they do agree with his goals for the war to eliminate Hamas and likely Hezbollah. Uh, next, uh, elections right now would really cripple the government for months. And uh, just when Israel is at its most vulnerable, uh, certainly now with the, uh, the anticipation of some Iranian retaliation, uh, it really doesn't seem to be the time when you want to go to elections. Uh, what's happening is that the same group that was uh, pro proposing these protests in the streets for months that wanted to overthrow Netanyahu before October 7th, uh, that group is now emerging, and uh, they're also enlisting some of the support of the hostage families is with them. So that's what's happening right now. But I would say the majority uh, of Israelis really don't want uh, to go to elections right now, certainly not in the middle of a war with a major war looming on the horizon. There's been talk the White House is working with Israeli leaders like Gantz to topple the Netanyahu coalition government. Uh, are you hearing that on the ground there? Uh, that's what I'm hearing as well. Uh, from uh, First, there was an intelligence report a few weeks ago saying the government of Netanyahu may not last. Uh, that's certainly uh, not necessarily the case. Uh, Benny Gantz then visited the White House a few weeks ago. He also met with uh, Senator uh, Chuck Schumer. And then uh, not too long after that, uh, Schumer's speech on the Senate floor calling for new elections. Uh, Biden agreed with uh, uh, Schumer's speech. And then Gantz, last night, uh, calls for new elections. Uh, Schumer says, I was right all along. As, as some are connecting those dots, and they're really seeing an orchestrated campaign to try to undermine Netanyahu. And the reason for that is many, they disagree with his policies. It's no secret that uh, Netanyahu and the White House disagree on uh, a two-state solution. Uh, they disagree necessarily with what will happen uh, the day after uh, you know, the war with Hamas is over in Gaza. And so that's what some people are saying. They, they see the White House kind of orchestrating this and trying to undermine the Netanyahu government. Chris, we know hostages are a major political issue. Where do the hostage talks stand now? Well, unfortunately, there seems to be very little movement right now. Uh, Ismail Haniya, who is the leader of Hamas in, uh, in Qatar, uh, he was in Tehran as well uh, not too long ago. He's saying that Hamas is committed to two goals, uh, a permanent ceasefire and a full Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Both of those are non-starters for Israel uh, after October 7th. So it seems like Hamas is entrenching itself uh, against uh, any any particular hostage deal. And so I don't see anything necessarily in, in the near time future. Unfortunately, that's not good news for many of these families whose hostages, whose loved ones are still in captivity for almost six months now. Mm -hmm. Chris Mitchell reporting for us from Jerusalem. Thanks as always for your insights. Stay safe. And of course, we back here are praying for you and our entire team there on the ground in Israel. Coming up here at home, the focus on the white evangelical vote in this year's presidential election. We're going to take a look at how these voters came to support former President Donald Trump and some of the key issues in this year's race for the White House. We'll have that story for you when we come back.
voters have tended to favor conservative Republican candidates. That's evangelical voters. They've done that in the past. In the last two presidential elections, Trump garnered the support of 80 percent of white evangelicals. CBN chief political analyst David Brody brings us this look at how this coalition developed and the key issues in this year's election. Defining the evangelical voter has always been a challenge, and nowadays it's become even more complicated. Former GOP nominee for president Mike Huckabee says evangelicals don't just fit into one box anymore. I get so tired of hearing particularly this line. Well, evangelicals are all, and then fill in the blank. Evangelicals are not all anything. Evangelicals are people with a lot of different views. Huckabee knows the playing field because when he first ran for president in 2008, his more populist tone resonated with evangelicals. Bless our president, Donald Trump. Long before Donald Trump came along. I was talking about working class issues. And at that time, it was a little bit too soon for the Republican Party to hear it. Fast forward to 2024 and headlines such as Trump has transformed evangelicals and is connecting with a different type of evangelical highlight the change. Those result from the former president's appeal to those who might not attend church regularly and are seen as anti-establishment and anti-elitist. Chad Connolly leads the Get Out the Vote organization, Faith Wins. I think it's fair that he's brought out a whole different segment of voters that have been really missing. And that, and that includes evangelicals. Absolutely includes evangelicals. A growing distrust of the federal government has helped drive this change. In 2017, 31% of white evangelical Protestants expressed trust in the government. Today, the number has dropped more than half to 15%. Perhaps a more telling shift is the standard on personal morality of a candidate. More than a decade ago, 30% of white evangelicals believed an elected official could commit personal immoral acts and still be ethical in their public life. That number has now skyrocketed to 72%. Then there's the contrast in education. Exit polls in this year's GOP primaries show that while Trump split the college-educated evangelical vote, he wins more than two-thirds of those who didn't go to college. We heard during the Obama years that the left wouldn't go visit in the areas in Pennsylvania that were coal mining areas that were just blue collar, go to work, flag waving, God fearing, but might have a beer on a Friday afternoon kind of thing and go to church once a month. I do think that Trump has brought those people out. Many of those voters are likely former Democrats or independents who have added a new layer to the evangelical column. They're also seen as leaning toward Trump on issues like illegal immigration, economic uncertainty, and that lack of trust in the federal government. There's something going on in the country. What he says makes sense, and it makes sense to the hardworking people of America. Connolly's group is planning a Common Sense America tour, which stops at churches nationwide. Instead of the usual church conference focusing on areas such as life and marriage, this tour will be broader, touching on issues deeply affecting the church. David, I've been in 11 states this year. Not a single one hasn't been affected by the drug trafficking, the fentanyl. I'm, I've had churches who had deacons or members or tithers or people who really involved in their church, Sunday school teachers who've lost kids to this fentanyl poisoning stuff, or even people in their family and community and the churches are the backstop. So I just think this populist movement is because people are fed up with what's going on and you don't have to be a Christian to see it. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Some current developments like what happens at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, UFOs and more, and how they're tied to biblical prophecy. We're going to hear from co-authors of a new book on the subject right after this. UFOs, red heifers, and the Temple Mount. What do these phenomenons have to do with the end times biblical prophecy? The co authors of the new book, Revelation 911, explain on this week's episode of The Global Way. So the Apostle Paul talks about a powerful delusion that would deceive much of the world in the end times. And so with, you know, for decades now, we've seen all these TV specials, Star Wars, Close Encounters, you name it. 
uh, that, that sort of created this uh, UFOs and aliens as sort of a, a religion to a, a certain number of people. In fact, there's polls showing that far more people believe in the extraterrestrials and UFOs than believe in the God as as he's describing the Bible, a biblical worldview. And so as, we, as we've seen these congressional hearings and all these things going on about the supposed reverse engineering of alien technology we've discovered, we, we wanted to delve into this in Revelation 9-11. And, uh, you know, I interviewed a, a uh, well-known astrophysicist Hugh Ross at Reasons to Believe, and he knows other uh, astrophysicists that you know JPL and NASA, and they say that they don't believe that these aliens are coming from another uh, planet or another galaxy, but they're interdimensional. And of course, that's what the Bible talks about. There's a great spiritual battle going on. So, is it possible that these all these uh, reports of uh, aliens and UFOs is this uh, demonic in, in nature? Paul, what do you think? The Nephilim, fallen angels, they're receiving a lot of social media attention. So tell us why they you are. believe that's part of a great deception here. Yes, yes, Gary. I mean, for sure we had the giants. We know that in Genesis chapter 6. We know that the giants then had to be defeated when Joshua went across the Jordan River into Canaan. He ran into tribes after tribe of giants. But God gave us deliverance. Even David took down Goliath. But in these last days, we're starting to hear about cloning, transhumanism, artificial intelligence, using technology and, and gene splicing, cloning, where we're, we're totally realizing that man is trying to figure out a way to recreate the superhuman race, these super soldiers. We even hear that being said by nations like Russia and others that are studying this. So we're in the time of great deception. We're in the time of great uh, trying to shift everyone's attention away from God and to have fear about the unknown when we should really be putting our faith in God. We dig deep into this, Gary, in Revelation 9-11. We even we uncover those uh, secret societies that are involved and a whole lot of others that are involved in this deceptive agenda. So we're keeping a focus on it in this book to show just how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Troy, uh, how does AI play into all of this? Because uh, I know I've interviewed a number of people who say, hey, AI soon will be much smarter than human beings. Uh, so if it becomes smarter than humans, then why not just worship AI instead of God? I, I can see how that's the next progression. How does this fit into end times? Yeah, even the, the famous trans, transhumanist Noah Harari uh, in Israel, he's talked about using AI to rewrite the Bible. And so, you know, the, the Apostle John, you know, 2,000 years ago, trying to describe what would be happening in the end times, he talked about the image of the beast, the mark of the beast. And so the first, first time in history, because we have an artificial intelligence, electronic banking, computer chip implants, Neuralink implants, brain chip implants, uh, the surveillance state, you can actually have this mark of the beast system for the first time in history where you can't buy or sell. And that's what the Bible warns us of. The Antichrist and false prophet will preside over a global economic system. And so with artificial intelligence, with the super intelligence that now been created, we, we can see this. And I think John, or the apostle, talked about this in the book of Revelation, just used terminology from the, the first century. And Paul, one part of eschatology, of course, is the construction of the third temple on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. An important event leading up to that is, of course, the sacrifice of an unblemished red he uh, heifer. Five red heifers are now in Israel, and I, I think they're in uh, Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was once housed. So these heifers are now old enough to be uh, in part of the ceremony. So what are your thoughts on that? Are we getting closer to construction of the temple? Oh, very close. Uh, Gary, I've been there 11 times. I've been on the Temple Mount 11 times. Just last year, I was at Shiloh. They were talking about these five red heifers that had already been brought in from farms in Texas. This is a focus like you wouldn't believe. Each time I go, the, the communication and the conversation uh, by uh, some of my friends, which are actually some uh, ultra-Orthodox, they are focused on building this temple. So even the attack on October 7th by Hamas was totally, and Hamas admits it, it was what they called the Alaska flood. But their fear was that the red heifer, would, the ashes would be burnt, and it would start the process of building the third temple. So you're watching the whole world converge upon the navel of the world, really, the Holy Land itself. We are truly living now in the beginning stages of a prophetic timeline that won't turn back. 
Okay, wars and rumors of wars and signs and wonders. The book is Revelation 911. How the book of Revelation intersects with today's headlines. Troy Anderson and Pastor Paul Begley, thank you for sharing your insights. We appreciate it. God bless you guys. Also on this week's episode of The Global Lane, they discuss the prophetic significance of the coming total solar eclipse. We'll bring you a look at the bogus trial and hefty jail sentences and fines given to 11 evangelical Christians in Nicaragua. You can see all of that on The Global Lane tonight on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app or you can watch on YouTube. We'll be right back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. Time now for your Thursday thankful. I invite you to join me in this prayer of gratitude. Father, thank you. God, thank you for your patience. You never give up on me. Even when I fail, you don't. You won't. You can't. And I thank you. Amen and amen. Take a moment and join me in this prayer of gratitude and make this a thankful Thursday from the very start to the very finish. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel at any time as well as online. That's CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.